Our scripture today comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 to 10. It says, We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brother is loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. When you're reading the Bible, um, you'll often find come across people in Israel or in the church worshiping other gods, and you think, what the heck could they have been thinking? I mean, it's not like it's something you do by accident. You don't slip and fall and find that you've bowed down to an idol. And it seemed like it was genuinely hard, no matter how motivated they were, for them to stop worshiping idols. So what could have possibly motivated them to worship idols? In the Exodus story, Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the law from God. And the Israelites get impatient and think, while well, Moses is gone, I guess we need to make a God to lead us. So they make the golden calf and say that that was the God that led him out of Egypt, and that's the God they'll worship. Okay, what the heck, right? Like, you know that you made that God. You literally just fashioned it with your hands. What makes you think that's going to help you at all? So one of the reasons that I think it was hard to stop worshiping idols was because they believed that the whole earth was in the control of the gods. Everything from politics to religion to farming to sports was under the control of the gods. So if you want anything to go well, you probably want to have the gods on your side. If you fail to worship the gods, there's a good chance that literally everything in your life will go wrong because all the gods are angry with you. What Christianity said was that there was one God who was in control. Everything from politics to religion to farming to sports was under the control of the one true God. Our passage from Psalm 24 in the call to worship, if you remember, goes straight from talking about how you shouldn't worship idols to saying the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And that makes sense. If the entire world belongs to God, if he controls it all, what point is there in worshiping anything else? Even if we don't worship other gods, we make the same mistake a lot. And in that way, we have a habit of doing something really similar to idolatry. We have the habit of saying that Christianity and our worship of God belongs in one specific place, just like they thought that the worship of their God belonged in one specific place. We think that our worship of God belongs in church on Sunday, or maybe some other day of the week too. We say that as long as we don't literally bow down and worship some other God, we're fine but we often act like God doesn't own the entire world. We say that the earth is the Lord's, but if it really is the Lord's, then that should have a real impact on our finances. The primary of our pr purpose of our money then is to honor God. And that can happen in all sorts of ways, but the main goal is still the same. If the earth is the Lord's, then that should have a real impact on our work. We strive through our work to be genuinely helpful, helpful to other people and not to sell things to them that won't actually help them. If, if, if the earth is the Lord's, then that means that even the internet, even that wretched hive of stun, stum and villainy, is the Lord's. We use the internet to foster real life connections with other people and not as a drug to isolate ourselves from other people. If the earth is the Lord's, then our government is the Lord's. And that doesn't mean creating a state religion, but it does mean our understanding of justice and power should come from the gospel. And we don't use politics to destroy those we hate 
or as a God that we serve, but as a tool of self-sacrificing love to grow a community that looks more like God's kingdom. If the earth is the Lord's, then we are the Lord's. And that means that we have the unique role in all creation to glorify and to serve God with every part of our being. And when we do that, when we fulfill God's role, our God-given role, and put every part of our lives in their proper place, then of course that will be a more fulfilling life. Because we're living exactly as we were made to live. Nothing else in all of creation other than God himself is higher than humans. So that means that idolatry, which is trusting in something other than God, is enslaving us to something subhuman. And that calls us to a life that's far lower and far more boring than the life that God calls us to live. Idols always call for more and more of you until you prostrate yourself to them. Another of the biggest reasons that it was hard to avoid idolatry in the ancient world was because idols always had a threat attached to them. If you didn't worship the god of rain, it wouldn't rain and you'd starve. If you didn't worship the god of fertility, you wouldn't be able to have children and your line would die out. If you didn't worship the god of the sea, your ship would sink and you would die at the bottom of the ocean. Of the ocean. And you obviously didn't want all that. So you'd pay your tribute and you'd worship and you'd, that way things would go smoothly. Eventually, you wouldn't even think about it. Before you go on your ship, you make your sacrifice. And it's not even something you think about, like paying at a toll booth. You trust the idols and you do what they tell you to do and don't even realize just how much of the, your life they're taking up. It would take a massive leap of faith to stop worshiping idols because you never know what's going to happen next after you stop. The same thing is true for us too. We have idols that enslave us as well. We trust in lots of things to the extent that we don't trust in God when he tells us to do stuff with them. And the way they do it is very often through a threat. If you don't have all the money you could possibly get, you'll lose everything and you'll starve. If your political party doesn't win the election, all of civilization will collapse. If you don't work 80 hours a week, there's going to be no meaning in your life. If that person doesn't go out with you, there's no hope in the world. All of these idols threaten you that if you serve God and put them in their proper place, everything will collapse. We're not all that different from the ancient people, are we? If you're familiar with the way that I do work, what I normally do is try and work really hard on whatever I am feeling happen to be feeling inspired about at this certain moment. What that means is there's a lot of times I'll work on projects that are due months in advance because I'm starting to get a feel for what I'm going to do for them and then save other things until like a few days or before it's due. A lot of times I'll have my sermon for a Sunday done like a month or two in advance and then come back to it right before I, get, before I give it. That was not the case for this sermon. I had it scheduled out since February that I was going to preach about idolatry sometime this week. I was reading through the first Thessalonians and thought, hey, this would be a fun topic. But for a number of different reasons, I didn't start this sermon until this past Thursday. I just never really felt all that inspired for it. And I really don't think that was a coincidence. Maybe it was because I was feeling convicted that I wasn't living out what I was preaching. Or maybe it was because God was stopping me and forcing me to really slow down and take this week seriously and to struggle with what's going on in my own life before I talk about it. This week, I think that God forced me to confront some of my own idols. I like to think of myself as a happy guy, that I'm gener generally in control in all of my emotions, and I've found a meaningful life for myself. I think that's generally true. I like to think that the things I enjoy are the things that are productive and good for me, and I have my life pretty much figured out. But this week, I had a lot harder time with it. A lot of the stuff that normally makes me satisfied, that I rely on, just wasn't doing it. Normally, I'm happy when I'm reading my Bible or hanging out with friends or doing work or cleaning the kitchen. <laughs> but for whatever reason, I was having a hard time finding any satisfaction in those things. Of course, that would normally be just unpleasant but manageable. But it was made harder than it needed to be. And that's because I really trusted too much in the idea that I have everything figured out. That had become an idol for me. And God showed me this week that I still needed to trust in him for the future. It's not all figured out. There is a story in a book I read about 10 years ago, which I don't totally remember, um, called Counterfeit Gods by Tim Teller. The story went something like this. 
a guy has a feeling that there might be mice in his basement. He's all worried, and mice aren't exactly the most pleasant sight, so he's really hoping that when he gets down to the basement, he doesn't see any mice. So as he's walking down the stairs, he turns the light on and off, on and off. He stomps on every step and says out loud, gee, I hope there aren't any mice down there. And of course, he gets down the steps, and he happily takes note that he didn't see any mice. So he probably doesn't have a mouse problem. But that's not how you find out whether you have mice, is it? You make all the noise, and you announce your presence, and of course, the mice will find a place to hide, so you can't, can't find them. When you want to see mice in, the, in your basement, you tip down, toe down the first few steps, and then you jump down as quickly as you can to the bottom of the steps. And then you turn the light on as quickly as you can, and then you dart your eyes back and forth and to see if you notice any motion. Unless you do that, you have no idea if you have mice. Tim Teller said that suffering is for finding idols, a lot like jumping to the bottom of the steps is to finding mice. It's easy to say that you don't have any idols when life is going really well. But of course you wouldn't notice that you have any idols when things are going well. You're completely satisfied with your life, but it just might be built on a weak foundation. Checking for idols when everything is going right is like stomping on the stairs and making noise and turning lights on and off when you want to find mice in your basement. But suffering really reveals what you trust in. It jumps you to the bottom of the basement of your heart. And you can't help but see the stuff that's gone wrong there, which you prefer not to see. Where you go, where you go when things aren't going well often shows you what, what you really depend on. If something bad happens and the first thing I go to is food, that shows that I really depend on that. If I go to work and make sure that I don't feel as bad just by burying myself in work, that means I really depend on that. But if your first instinct is to recognize that you're totally dependent on God, that might be a good sign. You might also be able to see idols and the reasons that you suffer. If you're inordinately sad or angry when something fails at work, that might be because you haven't put all your trust, you put all of your trust in that instead of in God. Maybe you get really offended or bummed out when it looks like somebody is smarter than you. That might show that your intelligence is an idol and you trust in that to give you your identity. Of course, these aren't rules. Many times you suffer, and it's for no perfectly good reason, and there's nothing you could have done to stop it. But it's worth taking a look at yourself and your reactions when things aren't going right. Whatever the case, whether you know that there are idols in your heart or not, it can be really hard to live without them. Because one of the things that's most difficult with them is that a lot of idols, in and of themselves, are good things, and maybe even totally necessary. Rain is a good thing, and it's totally necessary. But worshiping Baal or Zeus, the gods of rain, is a bad thing. And it's such a bad thing that it will enslave you. Money is a good thing. You need it to survive. But mammon, the god of money, will enslave you. Entertainment is a good thing. But spending your entire life on a screen will enslave you. All of these things make for great tools and necessary tools, but terrible masters. On the one hand, there's certain idols like alcohol that you could swear off entirely and continue as a functioning person, hopefully. And if you recognize your idols and you can swear them off, that's a good idea. But there's some things like money or food that you literally can't live without. So what relationships are you supposed to have to them if you can't swear them off entirely? Idols are sneaky, and they like to manipulate you so you don't even recognize when they've enslaved you. So that's how the church family can help out. Paul says, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you yourselves became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. It might be possible for me to say something like, here's how you know when something has become an idol, and here's how you know your relationship with it is fine. Like, your relationship with the money is great if you think this, this, and this, and if you spend here and here and here, but it's gone really wrong if something else happens. But I think that underestimates just how sneaky idols can be in your brain. Because you could convince yourself of practically anything. Like, clearly I don't have an issue with this because this other person has a much bigger issue. Or, it might look like an idol, but I kind of need it right now. I'll work on this later. I mean, you might have lived with that idol your entire life, 
and it's enslaved you that whole time, so you don't even see it. For that reason, I think it's better just to say that you can find someone in your church who gives an example for how to live without that idol. If you have a problem with trusting too much in money and working for it instead of God, you can find someone who has a truly beautiful relationship with money. Maybe they're really generous and they use their money to bless everyone around them. Maybe they have a meaningful work life, but they don't bring it home with them too much. Maybe they've managed to somehow be content with whatever they have and aren't worried about getting the next big thing. Just stolding yourself into having a better relationship with this stuff doesn't really work very well. It's a lot easier to get rid of idols. We can see the path forward laid out by somebody, just like the Thessalonians laid out a path for Macedonian Achaia. And that's not just because you can see what it looks like, but also because you can see how beautiful the end goal really is. It's ugly to rely too much on money or sex or food or work. But most people can think of somebody who has a really good relationship with those things, and it's attractive. They just seem to be more happy and content. It's clear that they're free. There's no idols that are enslaving them. And that's the incredible thing. Idols promise freedom and threaten slavery, always. You get just that little bit more of money, and you'll be free. But then you find yourself at work your entire life, and you can't do otherwise. You think you spend a little bit more time on video games instead of going to work or going to school, and you'll be free. But then you find you have no time to do anything else. But you'll see that people who depend on God instead of idols are so much more free. They're content and happy, and they don't need to seek out one thing or another. So if you recognize that you're depending too much on stuff other than God in your daily life, seek out somebody in your church who seems to have a really good relationship with what has become your idol. Watch them and see how they live with it. If you can, ask them how they manage to keep that good thing in its proper place and not let it take over their lives. If you're not sure what, what, whether what you're relying on is an idol, just ask them about it, and they might be able to help you. Because it really is the difference between life and death. It's the difference between freedom and slavery in this life and in the one to come. Let's pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Give us the insight to see how we might fail to trust in you, and the courage to look at our hearts even when it's ugly. It's hard to notice it sometimes, but we put ourselves in the position of slavery to idols all too easily. Cleanse our hearts of our idols so we would be free to trust you and to serve you and to become what you created us to be. Amen.